Thank you for joining this IISS webinar, launching the Institute's new report, Assessing Iran's Missile and UAV Capabilities and its proliferation of these systems to regional partners. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website. Uh, when, you get, when we get to the uh, Q&A uh, part of the uh, session, uh, you know how it works. You can either pose questions by using the raise hand icon at the bottom of the screen, or you can uh, post questions in the chat room. Our study was not written with the intention of influencing negotiations with Iran on restoring the 2015 nuclear deal, the JCPOA. But given the interest in follow-on talks to address Iran's missiles and regional activities, we wanted to help inform the public debate on these matters. The report is a fact-rich technical assessment that draws exclusively on unclassified material, including in the Persian and Arabic uh, languages. It was initiated last year by our late colleague and dear friend, Michael Elliman, who tragically um, succumbed to cancer in February. I was brought back then to help steer the project through to completion, relying on substantive contributions by team members whom I will introduce in a few minutes. Our headline finding is that Iran's missile arsenal is intended not only for deterrence, but for battle, including by its regional partners. Now, many might say, duh. <laughs> Uh, but this is not how we used to understand Iran's missile doctrine. Over the past decade, that doctrine has changed from relying solely on punishing would-be attackers by striking cities and other high-value targets to also prioritizing improved precision to be able to deny potential foes their military objectives. Iran's clear priority is improving precision. You can see this in several of Iran's newest missile systems in three different categories. The Qiyam short-range ballistic missile, which has been smuggled to Houthi rebels, may have ground-based guidance augmentation. A modified version used in the January 2020 attack against Ain al-Assad Air Base in Iraq appears to have a maneuverable reentry vehicle. The Ahmad medium range ballistic missile with a claimed range of 1800 kilometers is also said to have a separating maneuverable reentry vehicle. And the solid fuel short range ballistic missiles in the Fatah family have terminal guidance. The Fatah family also shows the important strides Iran has made in solid propellant missiles, which are advantageous for several reasons, including their short launch preparation time. The remarkable rolling out of three new Fatah variants, Zulfagar, Desfo, and Hajj Qasim, in just the past four years is indicative of a significant developmental emphasis. Now, in the past, we wrote a lot about Iran's Shahabs and its Ghadr missiles. Now, despite facing export controls, uh, massive sanctions, and UN Security Council resolutions, Iran has made significant improvements to all of them. The introduction of so many variants had made it hard for us to say for certain how many different ballistic missiles Iran has in its arsenal. In the end, we counted up to 20, six to eight liquid fuel systems, and up to 12 that use solid propellant. The exact number depends on how one uh, counts variants and which systems are deemed to be in service. Now, Iran does not have the longest range missiles in the region, nor the most powerful. Israel wins those prizes, but Iran does have the largest and most diverse arsenal. Iran is expanding its capacity to strike across the region through the continuing development and introduction of armed um, UAVs and cruise missiles. Douglas Berry, IIS Senior Fellow for Military Aerospace will expand on this when I give him the screen. 
Like its ballistic missiles, support for regional actors has become a prime pillar of Iran's military posture. Consultant Fabian Hintz will elaborate on the proliferation trends, which may be the most interesting aspect of the IIS report. I'll just note our conclusion that Iran's missile proliferation efforts have profoundly destabilizing consequences for the region by providing powerful force multipliers for unaccountable non-state actors. This development raises questions in terms of command and control as well as attribution. The fact that Iran, usually known for careful calibra carefully calibrating its actions, is willing to supply these systems and have them used in combat by allies seems to demonstrate a greater willingness to take risks, as well as a more offensive outlook for Iran's missile program in general. Finally, IISS research analyst John Krasaniak will talk about recent developments in Iran's space program. Now, I'm on record as saying that Iran does not have an intercontinental ballistic missile program, but the solid fuel space launch vehicles that Iran has introduced recently have more carryover potential for weapons use than did the liquid fuel launchers that Iran earlier relied upon. Before turning over to my colleagues, let me end with five points. First of all, I hope it's clear that lacking a modern air force, Iran views missiles and UAVs as vital to its defense. Under no circumstances will it give them up, at least not entirely. For now, secondly, for now, all of Iran's ballistic missiles are apparently adhering to a self-imposed range limit of 2,000 kilometers. This limit is in keeping with Iran's emphasis on precise strikes in the battlefield. But two systems under development press the envelope for the range limit, the Sajil and the Karamshar. Thirdly, while Iran continues to receive some foreign technical help, it has a well-developed domestic industry and a rigorous engineering management process that enable it to develop and produce missiles on its own, with the exception of the Karamshar. Our report lays out in detail the organizational structure of Iran's missile and space programs. Fourth, Iran has been pursuing three potential pathways that would allow it to acquire an intercontinental ballistic missile if it were to so decide. It would be good, obviously, if they didn't go down the North Korean pathway. And fifth, while our report is about Iran's capabilities and trends, it should be recognized that Iran is not the only state in the Middle East to employ missiles. The IISS is developing an interactive web-based platform that maps missile holdings as well as other military capabilities for all states in the region. We hope to roll this out in conjunction with this year's Manama Dialogue. And with that, I turn over to Douglas Berry to talk about UAVs and uh, cruise missiles. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll make some brief comments on Iranian cruise missile and uninhabited aerial vehicle developments that are addressed, uh, obviously, more broadly in the report. Uh, while the focus of concern regional and further afield has understandably been on Iran's increasing and increasingly capable ballistic missile imagery, its cruise missile aspirations had until comparatively recently and deservedly received less attention. Tehran's two-decade-long effort to acquire a credible land attack cruise missile capability had until the past couple of years appeared to have been less than successful. Now, it was only with the Houthis' use uh, and sometimes claimed use of a 700 kilometer range land attack cruise missile that Tehran's aspirations have been met, if not completely when it comes to range. And by a cruise missile that Iran has so far not shown or indeed said that it's in its own inventory. The missile known as the Quds-1 uh, or, or Project 351 uh, and the extended range Quds-2 have been used to attack infrastructure targets in Saudi Arabia proving the design and allowing Tehran to field test the weapon. The Quds, or 351, appears to be the third in a triumvirate of Iranian land attack cruise missile development paths. The first was intended to be based on the Russian Ka-55 strategic cruise missile airframe, 
six of which Tehran had acquired covertly from the Ukraine in either 2000 or 2001. The Ka-55 base design has been associated with the, the Meshkat, which was first mentioned in 2012, Sumar, which was first shown in 2015, and lastly in 2019, the Havese. Meshkat has never been shown, while the main external difference between Sumar and Havese is that the former had a turbofan-style engine housing and the latter a turbojet housing. Turbofans are more, more fuel efficient and offer greater range, but also more complex in engineering terms. And the maximum sighted range for the Meshkat, Sumar and Havese development line reflect this, with Meshkat, Sumar associated with a 2000 plus uh, class range missile and the Havese with a range of around uh, 1000 kilometers. Uh, the Houthi may have attempted an attack on the UAE using Sumar in 2017, but if this attack did occur, then it obviously failed. However, the US now considers that one of the Meshkat, Sumar or Havese variants is operational. The 2019 use of at least seven of the smaller and shorter range Quds cruise missiles on Saudi Arabian oil facilities was by comparison a success. Although, as I previously mentioned, this missile is yet to be displayed by Tehran. Uh, the third design, the Ya'ali, was first shown in 2014 and may indeed have been a rival to the Quds. Uh, but today, the status of the Ya'ali remains uncertain. Iran, however, now has two ground-launched land attack cruise missile designs for use, the Quds of 351 and a Meshkat Sumar Havese variant to complement its ballistic missile inventory and to complicate further the, the demands on defences. Uh, by comparison, Iran's UAV programs stretch back at least a further two decades, with today a wide range of small and medium weight class UAVs in the inventory, and the introduction of a new heavy UAV pending. Initially developed for the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance role, Iran now fields ISR armed and direct attack UAVs. The 2019 attack on Abkhek and Quraysh, though claimed by the Houthi, exhibited the combined and coordinated use of direct attack UAVs and cruise missiles, which suggested strongly that Tehran had planned and carried out the attacks. Uh, in closing, what might we expect to see in terms of future developments uh, with regard to land attack cruise missiles, we'll likely see continuing efforts to improve range and accuracy, along with additional launch uh, platforms, uh, either maritime or, or air. And in the case of UAVs, the adoption of wider roles uh, and there also remains the question of, of beyond uh, line of sight command and control for UAVs. And with that, I'll hand over to Fabian. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, one of the parts of our project was to take a deeper look into the missile proliferation of Iran to its proxies. And that's a pretty interesting topic because it keeps popping up in the news, but usually it's just single puzzle pieces and there's not that much analysis out that takes a look at the whole comprehensive strategic picture and technical picture. So our aim was to combine the detailed examination of the systems themselves and what is known about them in the open source with a bigger look at the strategies Iran is um, pursuing in this regard. And the most interesting finding of the report is that Iran's approach to proliferation of ballistic missiles and rocket artillery has become very multi-layered in the recent decade. So especially when you look at news art graphics, for example, there's still this idea that Iran just sends missiles or rockets, they are renamed uh, locally by proxies or Iranian allies. And this kind of direct provision through smuggling still continues, but it has been augmented by several other approaches. The first is third party provision, which has been going on um, for a while apparently, meaning that a third actor <clears throat> is providing the, the missiles the rockets on behalf of Iran, that might have been the case with Syria and Hezbollah, even though the data is not that confused. Uh, another very important approach of this um, multi-layered approach is the conversion of existing stockpiles of rocket artillery to precision guided missiles. That is very relevant when we're talking about Hezbollah's very, very large arsenal of rocket artillery. Um, and the various types of precision guided rocket artillery and ballistic missile Iran has developed on the basis of existing older systems. And perhaps the most interesting one is the whole scale transfer of production technology. Again, this has been mentioned before. So Iran has been assisting factions in Gaza uh, with rocket production. There were lots of reports about the Hezbollah missile facility. 
But it seems that Iran is really trying to enable all of its proxies, all of its allies to produce <clears throat> rocket artillery, but also precision guided missiles in many cases. We've seen this kind of approach uh, play out in Gaza, in Iraq, in Syria, and also in Yemen with various kinds of success, with various kinds of sophistication. When you look at the systems themselves, the change that Mark has already mentioned when it comes to Iran itself is also visible in the arsenals of Iran's proxies and allies. <clears throat> so before we had this, as in the 2006 war between Lebanon and Hezbollah, this very political use of rocket artillery to strike cities, to uh, inflict terror and exact political pressure through this measure. What we're now seeing, for example, in Yemen is very precise tactical military strikes that actually cause a lot of military damage on the battlefield. And this new focus on <clears throat> uh, providing precision guided missiles as well as production systems has quite a few policy implications. The first is that Iran is actually capable of outsourcing its deterrence to some degree, which has a great advantage in terms of range, because as the founder of Iran's missile program said, why are we gonna buy expensive 2000 kilometer range missiles when Tel Aviv is only 200 kilometers away from parts of Lebanon. Um, at the same time, Iran has new levels of deniability. Some of these systems local proxies are producing are not exactly identical to the Iranian ones. So if they're used in combat, either as parts of local conflicts or directly on the orders of Iran as part of Iranian gray zone campaigns, you can get a better cover of deniability than if Iran did the attacks themselves. And last but not least, there are issues when it comes to command and control. The use of ballistic missiles and heavy rocket artillery is always risky because the effects cannot be too well calculated in many ways. And we just don't know how the command and control with a lot of these groups work. With some of it's more clear with more loyal proxies like Hezbollah, but with the Houthis, for example, it's just very unclear how, directly, how direct Iranian control is, whether it's more indirect. And that could have major implications in future escalations. And with that, I'm going to hand over to John for a deep look at Iran's space program. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, I'm going to talk about recent developments in Iran's space program, which is mainly focused on putting satellites into orbit using carrier rockets or space launch vehicles. Um, it's important to clarify from the beginning, though, that there are actually two separate space efforts in Iran. On the civilian side, there's the effort run by the Iranian Space Agency, which in the past has coordinated the launches of the Safir and the Seymour. But separately, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has its own effort focused on solid propellant space launch vehicles. And this program has come out of the shadows quite recently. There are two new developments that I want to discuss. The first was a year ago when the IRGC launched its first space launch vehicle called the Qased, putting Iran's first military satellite into orbit. And this is the coming out of the shadows that I just mentioned. Before Qased, all the space launches were done by the Iranian Space Agency. They used rockets with liquid fuel motors developed by Iran's main missile industry entity. Um, but this launch was quite different. The Qased did use a liquid fuel first stage similar to that of the Safir, but the second stage was an advanced solid propellant motor developed by the IRGC. Um, and an IRGC commander said that future launches would use a solid fuel first stage as well. So these would be all solid fuel space launch vehicles. That brings me to the second and perhaps more significant and surprising development which was the launch of the Zoljana space launch vehicle, which was revealed in February this year. Zoljana was remarkable because it used a solid fuel <clears throat> first stage, the first Iranian space launch vehicle to do so. And given what I just said about the IRGC program, you might assume this was also launched by the IRGC as a follow-up to the Qased, but it wasn't. Surprisingly, the Zoljana had all the hallmarks of Iran's regular space program. Um, and this wasn't just any solid fuel first stage motor on the Zoljana. This was the largest solid fuel motor Iran has ever flight tested at one and a half meters in diameter. Um, in the report, we estimate that if flown on a ballistic trajectory with a one ton warhead, 
the Zojana could travel about 5,000 kilometers, which is obviously much further than any of Iran's current missiles today. Um, and in a separate section of the report, which Mark alluded to in his introductory remarks, we discuss potential pathways to an ICBM if Iran ever chose to build one. And we see this as one such path. Um, from there, I will pass it back to Mark. Thanks very much, John. And uh, uh, thank you, Douglas and, and Fabian. Uh, we now enter uh, the Q&A uh, part of our session. Um, you all may have noticed that uh, we adhere to a pretty strict time limit in our introductory remarks so that we could uh, uh, save time uh, for Q&A. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are two ways to pose questions. You can um, use the raise hand function, uh, or you could uh, pose questions in the, um, in, the uh, in the chat room. And I see a couple of questions have been posed in the chat room. Uh, and so um, let, me, let me get to those. So the question has come up, uh, for the past three years, Israel this is from Ben Berry, one of our colleagues. For the past three years, Israel has been attacking Iranian facilities in Syria to destroy shipments of missile technology destined for Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, he asked how effective uh, these have, attacks have been uh, and Fabian, I'll probably turn this over to you. And I think the answer is not just how effective have the attacks been in, in hitting their targets, but how effective in degrading Hezbollah's uh, capabilities. So this is a really, really interesting question because here we're seeing a huge conflict of opinions between what Hezbollah and Israel is saying. So we have some Israeli statements that Hezbollah has only been able to acquire very few precision guided missiles. Hezbollah is saying they're having enough. I would say it's important to understand which of the different approaches the strikes in Syria are targeting. So one is the direct transfer of missiles uh, through Syria. The other is the production in Syria. There has been one facility near Masyaf, which was intended for solid propellant production that has been completely devastated by Israeli airstrikes. I'm actually kind of surprised they're still rebuilding it from time to time because it um, has been destroyed so many times. I think the thing with Hezbollah is one has to look at the precision guidance conversion of existing arsenals. Um, Hezbollah has large numbers of Zelzal long range artillery rockets, slightly shorter range Iranian Fajr artillery rockets with ranges up to 75 kilometers. And if you look at what Iranians have been publishing, um, they have developed precision guided versions for all of these systems, which can be retroactively um, <clears throat> mounted to these. Uh, existing stockpiles. Uh, Hezbollah also allegedly got several Syrian early generation Fortech copies, and these can also be upgraded, of course. And if you look at the size of the components needed, it's very, very small. It's all very easy to smuggle. So I'm having doubts about whether Israel was capable of really um, striking a blow to the precision guidance conversion efforts. But I have little doubt that the efforts to produce missiles in Syria and some of the shipments have probably uh, been affected quite a lot. Thanks, Fabian. Um, I see that uh, Frank Hoffman at NDU would like to pose a question. Uh, could Frank Hoffman please be unmuted so that he can uh, pose his question live? Frank, I think you're, you're ready. Are you there? Yeah, Mark, uh, very much appreciated. I, I think uh, Brigadier Ben's question might have gotten to the same point. I'm, I'm trying to get to an estimate on Hezbollah's improvement uh, in a percentage terms. You know, uh, 15 years ago, a very small percentage of weapons were precise or could actually hit something. You know, the volume might be there today uh, if you listen to Hezbollah. Uh, but I was wondering if we have a a percentage estimate from our experts in terms of the qualitative increase in both range and accuracy that Hezbollah may be able to range over at the entire area of uh, northern Israel with a degree of precision on cities, infrastructure, and military installations that it didn't have 15 years ago. Okay. So if it, if it was less than 10% 15 years ago, what percentage do we think is going to be accurate today? I don't know if we can get that precise, Frank, but uh, Fabian, what do you think? Uh, this is really, really difficult to answer. Like basically all questions regarding to numbers, even with Iran owns missile arsenal are very difficult to um, answer. Some Israeli sources have been saying about 200, like one or two years ago, others have been saying it's only a few dozens. 
um, there were reports that 1000s are red line for the Israeli army, although I'm suspecting they're slightly shifting the goalposts with the red lines here. Hezbollah people on the record of the record have been saying it's two per week when it comes to the conversion process. But in the end, it's just very, very difficult to say how, how many they managed to retroactively upgrade to precision guidance. So unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I thought that might be your answer. Um, Emmanuel uh, Farhuglia, uh, Farhuglia in, uh, in, in Rome has asked, in strategic terms, can we divide the delivery systems into one deterrence-oriented systems, two M uh, missile, uh, medium-range ballistic missiles, and third, uh, long-range? Um, we didn't make such an attempt, uh, Emmanuel, but I want to uh, share, us the, share the, um, the list of systems that Iran has. So let me do a share screen if I remember how to do this. And this list uh, uh, partially addresses that question. Um, especially if you uh, look at uh, the, um, let's see, do we have, uh, yeah, we have the C, um, we have a, in the final column over here on the right, the um, circular air probable, which is a, indication of uh, accuracy. And for uh, systems that have a very high uh, CEP uh, with uh, you know, the Shahab 2 and the uh, Qiyam and the Shahab 3, um, the Karamshar, uh, you know, these you might say are for deterrence because they're not precise enough to, to hit hardened targets. But for, but for many of its systems, Iran, as we said in the introduction, has been uh, making them uh, more precise. Uh, you know, um, the uh, modified Qiyam uh, down to uh, uh, maybe 100 um, uh, CEP is very precise. Uh, some of them we don't know yet. They mod, uh, you know, probably is in, the, is in the three digits, but we're not entirely sure. So this is one way of, of measuring. And um, if you look at the range here, you'll note that there are no systems uh, that are long range. The, the highest, as we said, is the 2000 kilometer uh, range that um, the Supreme Leader uh, stated a few years ago. So Iran doesn't have any uh, long range systems uh, right now, but it, you know, the Karam Shar could exceed the 2000 kilometer range. And, and if Iran pursued uh, the solid fuel large engine that's developing and applied those to ballistic missiles, it could go longer range. Okay, next, uh, next question. Um, Sorry, I've lost the questions here. Um, okay, there's a question um, Prem Kumar has posed. Why are some recent Syrian air defense interceptions more efficient? Uh, sometimes they say uh, Bavar 373 is used. Can you please comment on that? I'm not sure we can comment on Syria air defense interceptions. Is, do any of my colleagues <laughs> have a clue? Okay. Um, Mark, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. I, just very briefly, uh, if it's a reference to the Bavar 373, um, the, there's an open question as to whether that system is actually in service in, in Iran yet, never mind uh, been supplied elsewhere. So I think until we see um, some actual evidence that, that that system is one in Iranian service and two has been deployed elsewhere, I'd kind of be... I, Healthy skepticism, I suppose, would be my position. Thanks, thanks, Douglas. I appreciate that. Uh, Douglas Harding poses the question: How concerned should the Gulf states, the Middle East, and wider world be by Iran's missile program that appears to now have both range and precision? Is this a greater threat, uh, threat than that posed um, by its potential uh, nuclear uh, weapon uh, capability? So I guess I'm going to try to answer this, and if anybody else wants to join in. For Iran's neighbors, um, the range doesn't matter too much. Uh, you know, as Fabian said, it, it is, if Israel is only 200 kilometers away from, from Lebanon or only, uh, you know, 1,000 kilometers away from Iran itself, they don't need longer range systems to, for their uh, deterrence uh, against uh, regional uh, ad potential adversaries. Um, there have been some um, concerns in the past that Iran was developing longer range systems to deter uh, Europe, but they, you know, 2,000 kilometers gets them to Athens, maybe. 
And I don't think Greece is the, is the country they're, they're concerned about. Uh, but the precision of their, of their missiles means that they can be used uh, in, a, in a wartime or to um, attack um, the uh, air bases that um, adversaries would use uh, to generate high uh, air sorties that would be very vital in any war. So that, that is of concern. It's a concern um, in, in a wartime uh, scenario. The nuclear weapons concern is, um, is a concern uh, you know, for, <laughs> for bigger reasons. It's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a civilian uh, high casualty um, weapon if they were to develop it. It's a weapon that can could create likely would create a, a, a crescendo of, um, of a proliferation in the region as other states uh, sought uh, to match it. And of course, it's the it's the um, combination of nuclear weapons on um, highly capable uh, missiles that would present the greatest danger. Let me see here what we'd also. Do. Um, uh, here's another one I think is for you, Fabian. Uh, Farzan Sabet asks, what kind of indigenous missile production technology facilities has Iran been able to transfer to its regional allies, including the al-Assad regime, Hezbollah and Houthis? Uh, so this is production technology facilities. Uh, two, what do you see as the objectives of Iran's missile-based construction in and transfers to Syria uh, and Three, um, why do you think Iran is developing the Karamshar 1 2? Is this part of a, of a submarine launch ballistic missile or an ICBM? I'm going to, uh, the first two are for you, Fabian. Um, John, you want to maybe talk about the Karamshar? Yeah, okay, Fabian, please. Um, so, when it comes to the transfer of production capabilities, um, I think it's very important to note here that. Ballistic missiles and precision guided rocket artillery, it used to be two very different systems. Now the border between the two has become a little bit murky, a very much a spectrum. So it's very, very easy comparably to build rocket artillery. It's very, very difficult to build long range missiles, but there's a lot of um, stuff in between. And Iran has been transferring a lot of production capabilities for what would could call long range precision guided rocket artillery. So, um, Syria was the very first instance. They actually built a very sophisticated factory for uh, its early generation for Teh missiles near Aleppo, um, which then was evacuated to Masyaf and uh, there the Israelis bombed it continuously. When we're looking at other parts in Gaza, you have a pretty large, um, pretty long going uh, effort to develop rocket artillery. Um, a lot of the rockets that are being used by Hamas, by Palestinian Islamic Jihad are domestically manufactured. And the Iranians have actually admitted to transferring production technology there. In Lebanon, you have a factory in the Beka Valley. It's not entirely clear um, whether it's operational. And then in Yemen, you do have new systems showing up that show very typical Iranian design features, sometimes low production quality, but are not identical to um, Iranian system, so it's exceedingly likely that the Iranians have also transferred some production capabilities to Yemen to build these kind of systems, which are used quite a lot. And the second question, I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, yeah, so um, the second question uh, was, what do you see as the, the objectives of Iranian missile-based construction in Syria or its transfers uh, to Syria? Mm -hmm. I think it's just this idea that, um, they want to expand their deterrence even more. They really want to encycle their uh, local um, rival Israel. And if you look at it from a Western perspective, perhaps what they're doing in Syria doesn't make much sense because they're incurring so many losses. And so far the results in Syria at least don't seem to be that impressive. But I would say, if you look at it from an Iranian perspective, that's how Lebanon used to be at the um, complete mercy of Israeli airstrikes with no real potential to strike back. And on the long term, perhaps they would like to have a similar capability, even though the groups on the ground might be very different from Lebanese Hezbollah in terms of organizational structure, to have another uh, deterrent leg in Syria, which of course um, adds the additional advantage of, advantage of spreading out your missile capability, the missile capability of your allies, but also um, providing deniability for gray zone strikes if you want. To. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, John, the question about uh, why do we think Iran is developing the Karamshar? Sure. Um, and for those who don't know, the Karamshar is uh, 
as a, a sort of a more advanced liquid fuel ballistic missile that's we think is based on the North Korean Musadon missile. Um, it's hard to say much definitively about it because there's so little open source information about the Khordam Shah. Um, I think we can pretty definitively say it's not part of an SLBM submarine launch ballistic missile project. Um, I think if I had to say, I would say it's part of Iran's sort of larger hedging strategy with respect to an ICBM where they are not committing to developing an ICBM right now, but they are building sort of the technological base um, and capability to, to have different pathways to get there if they ever decide to. So that's kind of how I think about the Hordam Shaft, but I'm sure others could reasonably disagree. And do one other thing maybe we should say about the Ramshar is that it has, it's not a very successful system so far. Um, I, I haven't all of the, um, the, the missile launches uh, failed at, as have five out of six of North Korea's uh, launches of the uh, equivalent Musudan system. Okay, Tim Wright, um, uh, another IISS colleague um, says, given that Iran relies on a deterrence by punishment strategy, which has driven the contours of its missile program. Could ballistic missile defense procurements by Iran's regional adversaries offset Iran, uh, to offset Iran's capabilities cause a, a, a further regional action reaction dynamics in response? What missile technology or capabilities might Iran pursue to ensure the penetration of missile defenses. I'm going to take a stab at this. You know, there are generally three strategies that states employ to overcome missile defenses. Uh, one is numbers, uh, one is um, uh, uh, decoys, and another is uh, faster penetration. And I think um, Iran has uh, employed uh, the first and third. Uh, I haven't seen anything about their development of, of decoys. Um, which is, is one way of uh, expanding the number of, of systems that the, um, uh, that the defender sees on the radar. But it probably wouldn't be that difficult uh, for Iran to do that if they chose to go down that path. In terms of numbers, it's not necessarily the, the number of, of missiles uh, that Iran could send, but, but how many it could send at once to overcome the missile defenses. And here, the number of, um, of transporter erector launches is uh, relevant. Iran has maybe 100 uh, TELs for its uh, short range systems, maybe 50 for its uh, medium range systems. And you know, if it employed them all at once, that would overcome um, uh, defenses. Uh, and then um, finally, the, the the uh, you know faster uh, penetration. I can't remember which it is of Iran's missile systems has. Uh, they've um, developed a, a you know a reentry vehicle. Uh, the technology allows it to penetrate. I think three times faster than, than originally. So this this is harder for the defenses. So yeah, there could be uh, this very dynamic that you mentioned, Tim, of uh, defense offense um, um, uh, dynamics uh, in the region. Uh, as the IISS had said in a, an earlier um, report a couple of years ago about uh, missile defense cooperation in the Gulf, there are other strategies that Gulf states can employ to uh, uh, to try to, try to counter Iran's uh, missiles. Not, I mean, one is in uh, missile defense to have a coordinated missile defense. Not every state just acting on its own. Another is uh, civil defense. Uh, civil defense can reduce the civilian casualties by by 50%. I mean, you look at how quickly Israeli citizens can get into um, into bunkers if they hear uh, an air raid siren. This is a kind of a of civil defense that can be uh, quite useful in in um, encountering. Uh, you can't deny the missiles attacking, but you can escape 50% um, of the casualties. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, Uh, this is a, a um, Charlie Hope asks, are the new missiles being developed by Iran as susceptible for intercepting by ADA, or are they more advanced uh, that they can avoid interception and destruction by existing uh, ADA? What is ADA? Is that, it, it, Douglas, do you know what ADA means? 
I assume it means air defenses. Okay, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> air defenses. Uh, uh, are they susceptible to being intercepted? Um, we didn't um, address this particular question. Um, we have to know more about the air defense systems. Um, but do any of my colleagues want to comment about this at all? I don't know, just simply say that there is vulnerable um, as any other weapons in this class. Uh, and it's partly dependent, obviously, in the nature of the defensive systems that they face. In terms of cruise missiles, I mean, the Kuds, by the look of it, uh, isn't a particularly fast missile. I mean, it's subsonic and it's probably uh, slower than, than some other subsonic cruise missiles, given, given the propulsion that it uses. Um, but as we saw in, in, in its use in the KSA, it, it, it managed to reach the target, or at least some of them did, some, some others didn't. Uh, whether those were shot down or either ran out of fuel or just uh, had a guidance failure, we don't know. Um, are they susceptible? Uh, yes, in the same way that any other system is, but it's got to be, you know, the, the, the defensive system has got to be kind of designed around engaging such targets. Thanks, Douglas. Francis Tammer poses a question to me saying that I said in my introduction that missile development would likely be non-negotiable for Iran. And where would this leave um, nuclear negotiators, as many within the US administration believe that missile development and Iran's regional activities need to be included? What do you judge might be the outcome? Okay, so just to repeat what I said in, in my introduction, I said that uh, under no circumstances will Iran give up its missiles, at least not entirely. So I left myself a caveat there. I think there are some systems that Iran would be willing to negotiate. Uh, and the, one that, the ones that they haven't fully developed are the ones that they would be most willing, I think, to put on the negotiating table. The Karamshar, uh, the Sajil maybe, since it's not probably operational yet. Um, uh, any potential ICBM development, uh, I think, is, is something that uh, could be negotiable. You know, states are, are always more willing to forego systems they don't yet have than to give up uh, missiles that are already in their arsenal. Um, you know, Iran, um, you know, might be uh, willing to accept uh, range limits. Uh, it, since it has a self-declared range limit of 2,000 kilometers, I have advocated that uh, it would be useful to lock this in. It wouldn't help uh, Iran's uh, regional neighbors, but it would help uh, Europeans if Iran didn't have a missile that could hit beyond Athens and, uh, and Sophia. Uh, but the, the, the missile uh, activity that I think is most important to negotiate, and it goes to the question about regional activities, is this whole proliferation of missiles to Iran's, Iran's um, partners in the region. This, I think, definitely uh, should be and can be on the negotiating uh, table. I don't think that it's absolutely necessary for Iran's um, you know, sovereignty, for its uh, uh, sense of its identity, uh, for its um, survivability to continue to maintain this pace of missile proliferation. And I think Iran you know, has some sense of, of guilt about this in, in that they won't even recognize that they send missiles to Houthi rebels. I mean, they, they won't recognize that they send anything to the Houthis. Clearly they do. So they know that, that it's prohibited by the United Nations. And uh, well, I, I, I shouldn't have said they feel a sense of guilt about it, but I think, you can, I think the fact that they don't, ex, they don't acknowledge it um, does uh, maybe allow for some room for negotiation. That, that should be, I think, the, the biggest focus of, of negotiations on missiles and regional activities, and it ties the two together. Uh, Okay, we have a question about, uh, let's see. Um, what, what's Russia's position on Iran's nuclear program and its use against Israel? Since Russia has refused to engage in combat with Israel and is developing ties with it, but is giving model missiles for Iranian designs. Okay, I'm gonna just take the last part of that question. I, I don't think Iran, Russia is not providing uh, missile designs to Iran, at least not anymore. Now, Iran's um, original missiles, the Shahab-1, the Shahab-2, were uh, 
Soviet era uh, Scud uh, B and C missiles, which Iran didn't get from Russia or from, from the Soviet Union. It got them from Libya and North Korea and maybe Syria. Um, there were um, some missile engines, the RD-250, that were developed in, uh, in the Soviet system uh, that were produced um, in, in Ukraine and, and, in, and stored in Russia. And North Korea got some of those RD-250 engines, and so did um, Iran. But it wasn't that, um, that Russia supplied them uh, to Iran. I think you have to be careful about um, assigning state responsibility. Now, you might say, well, you know, states should have been more careful about not allowing those systems out of their country. That would be a fair uh, criticism to make, but I wouldn't uh, assign culpability uh, to, uh, to Russia. And as for Russia's position on, on, on Iran's uh, nuclear program, I mean, they were a very uh, active partner in um, negotiating the 2015 um, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, and they're an active partner in um, trying to restore the JCPOA. So, so their position is pretty clear. Uh, I'm looking for ones that, questions that we can answer. Uh, there's some questions I don't think we can answer. Uh, okay, well, there was a question here by um, Ahmed uh, Al-Masari. I don't think we can answer this, but um, he meant to ask, how serious was the attack that fell by mistake, not mistake, 30 kilometers near the Dimona uh, reactor? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Uh, yeah, I can try. Yeah, uh, thanks. This is a really, really odd story. So um, we had this reports about an explosion not too far from Dimona and a missile strike. And then Israeli officials said it was actually a long range Syrian surface to air missile, an SA-5 that got lost during one of the Israeli attacks, which it wouldn't be the first time this happened. So uh, Syrian SA-5s have hit Jordan before, they once hit Cyprus. Um, they're very long range, and very, very old, not working too well. And that would make sense. There was some picture of debris um, showing Soviet made uh, electronic components. So that would all be consistent with a uh, surface to air missile um, going in the wrong direction. What is a little bit odd about this episode is that you have quite a lot of Iranian well connected news media claiming responsibility for the strike or indirectly doing so, which is really, really odd. Um, but absent a major Israeli cover up, which I don't think is very likely in this case. I don't think it was a um, purposeful attack using a surface to surface missile. It was indeed a surface to air missile that went uh, the wrong direction. Uh, thanks, Fabian. Um, I just noticed, uh, and I'm sorry, Matt, I didn't see this earlier. Matt McGinnis has, has his hand up. So could we please unmute Matt to let him pose his question? Uh, he's still muted. Can John, can, can John Matthew McGinnis please be unmuted? IT. Okay, um, IT, um, while you're working on unmuting um, McGinnis, I'm gonna ask another question. Okay, wait, no, he's still unmuted. Uh, a question by David um, DeRoche. What are the panel's views on Iranian and Houthi claims that the Houthi missile arsenal is Yemen produced, produced in, in Yemen. Is it indigenous assembled from Iranian components or imported in total from Iran? Uh, Fabian, this is a question for you, I think. Yeah, so this is a very, very interesting question and I hope to have like a further article on this very question released soon. Um, so when it comes to the Houthi arsenal, it's important to distinguish between several types of missiles they have. For example, the missiles they've been using to strike Riyadh, the Zulfatar, or the um, Burkan 2H, these are very clearly derived from the Iranian Riyom. And you can see from the way they're welded together that they've been smuggled to Yemen in pieces and reassembled. You had interdicted shipments showing missiles going to Yemen directly. However, when you look at the shorter range stuff, like the Badr series, the Nakal, you have, like in the range between 100 and 200 kilometers, you see systems that very likely seem to be produced inside Yemen using Iranian expertise. Probably the sophisticated components also are sourced from Iran or sourced from other sources outside the country in some cases. Um, 
So I would say it's a mix of systems that are directly imported from Iran for local reassembly and systems that are produced inside Yemen um, using Iranian designs, using Iranian sophisticated components, but having more local production. It's actually quite interesting because the Saudis have been saying, you know, all the missiles that are fired against us are directly coming from Iran. And a few weeks earlier, they released reports about bombing a missile factory inside Yemen. So there's a mix between both approaches. Okay, thanks, Fabian. Um, uh, Matt McGinnis, I'm told that you have to unmute yourself. And if you're there, um, if you, while we wait for you to do that, I'm going to uh, go back to some questions um, in, the, in the chat room. Uh, one from Jared French. How quickly could Iran reverse its limitation on missile range? If political limitations are removed, is Iran already capable of creating an ICBM uh, minus the nuclear warhead? Well, um, I would say that Iran can uh, remove this limit uh, very quickly because the you know the range limit is a function of uh, of, of warhead size, uh, weight, mass, and so if if you reduce uh, the mass, uh, the range uh, can go further within you know certain limits. And the Karamshar is a good example of this. Uh, it can travel two thousand kilometers with a um, a uh, you know a a cone that weighs um, on the order of was it two thousand kilometers, more than two thousand uh, kilograms. So if they, you know, it's a massive uh, warhead. If they reduced it to uh, five hundred uh, kilograms, um, the Karamshar could probably fly three thousand kilometers. Now it's not very, it's not an effective system yet. Um, your bigger question is about could Iran go into ICBMs? And here, you know, they couldn't do that overnight because um, developing ICBMs uh, it'd take a lot of time. If they use the RD-250 engines, um, you know, they, they would have to assemble a couple of different stages and then they would need uh, repeated tests. These tests would be obviously visible. Um, I think the development uh, would also be visible. So it can't happen um, right away. Um, the Karamshar is the one that could, could go first. Um, I have another question to you, Fabian. This is from Robin Wright. She asked to clarify, is Iran sending missiles and or conversion kits to Syria in an effort to Lebanize Syria and make Syria a front line where Iran's missiles fire on Israel? Or is Iran sending this material to have Syria as a backup production base for eventual transfer to Lebanon? So this is a bit of a difficult question. Um, when it comes to Syria, so the Iranian proxy model has evolved quite a lot over the recent decades. So in um, basically in Lebanon and Iraq in the 80s, you had this idea that you have one local party that will be the Iranian party in the country, so uh, the party of the Ira uh, Iranian Islamic Revolution. Uh, then the model evolved to having more and more different groups that fulfill different roles. And in Syria right now you have sometimes very murky and very fluid networks connected to Iran. And to what degree these should be enabled themselves, um, to what degree the Syrian state should be enabled to have a missile production capability, that is very difficult to know. So there are quite a lot of um, reports from Syrian opposition media that some Syrian um, groups loyal to Iran have already have ballistic missiles in storage. It's hard to verify them. I would say it's probably both. So there's an idea to, Lebanonize Syria to some degree, I would say, but also have a backup side to um, produce uh, stuff for Hezbollah. And if you look at, um, for example, the rockets Hezbollah fired during the 2006 war, almost all of them were actually made in Syria. When you uh, listen to interviews with defectors from Syria's um, missile production industry, they say after Bashar al-Assad took over, a lot of the production, if not more than 50% was actually destined for Hezbollah. You had the former, uh, the chief, current chief of staff of the Iranian Armed Forces saying, you know, the rockets Hezbollah used in 2006 uh, were produced in Syria using Iranian uh, supply technology. So I would say it fulfills both roles and it probably is designed to um, have some sort of like local Lebanon effect, so to say, but also act as backup for Hezbollah production. Thanks, Fabian. Okay, Matt, you are finally unmuted. So um, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, sorry about uh, that earlier, Mark. Uh, just some technical difficulties on this side. Um, you know, given how much they've had some improvements recently, 
uh, and especially what they're giving their proxies on armed drones. I'm very curious how, um, you know, how that, that, how that is affecting their decision-making when it comes to use of uh, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. And I, I'm, you know, certainly in the, in the last two years or so, you, you see armed drones taking a very prominent role uh, with the proxies. And, I, and I, I'm just curious if you're seeing a kind of a change in doctrine as they improve the accuracy uh, there and the capabilities of their drones, if they're in some way, is it just becoming a general uh, broader portfolio of capabilities uh, or do we see more energy being put into uh, the more precise armed drones, vice missiles? Thanks. Uh, Douglas, that's yours. Uh, in terms, I think we, we see uh, more effort going into accuracy uh, across the board when it comes to both um, UAVs uh, and cruise missiles. In terms of UAVs, um, it's probably qualify that comment by saying, uh, you know, there are at least two, if not three different classes that, 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 are, that are in play here. Um, direct attack systems, uh, then armed UAVs, uh, and potential also, depending on how you want to define them, loitering munitions. Uh, on the cruise missile side of the house, um, one of the areas that I, I think we kind of expect to see further developments uh, it, it, with, with Kuds, um, with the Sumar Meshka Avezi family, as, it, as it's known, is moving away from inertial uh, and probably just satellite-based nav to, to some kind of terminal guidance. Uh, we, we've seen no sign of that yet, but it's obviously an area I would imagine that they're working on. And um, finally, just in terms of um, the side of the house, obviously, once you give a kind of capability like Kuds to, to a non-state actor, um, there is a bit of an issue as to how you control that. Uh, I think we, we, you know, we've alluded to that in, in the discussions. Uh, Fabian, anything to add? Um, yeah, I would say it's uh, really the mix that is really, really interesting for non-state actors. I mean, in the end, both drones and ballistic missiles have the one thing in common that they are a way for actors to suddenly attack the strategic depth of countries that they couldn't uh, attack before and having both of them combination probably makes the most sense and with both we're seeing a huge drive towards accuracy I would say the one difference is that iran has been um, showing off its ballistic missiles and boasting about its ballistic missiles quite a lot while they're keeping a lower profile especially with the suicide drones where we have are now seen more but so far they have kept that much more quiet in the cruise missile part as well thanks um we got two minutes left. I've got four people uh, with good questions, I think. Uh, let me uh, try to get to them. Marcus Schiller, who knows this stuff very well, uh, says, according to the report, Iran increased the solid motor diameter of their newer Fatah family missiles, Zulfagar and Dusfal, from 610 millimeters to 680. How much confidence can be put into the 680 millimeter uh, value? Is it uh, from analyst measurements, or has Iran been communicating uh, this value? I just had a, a discussion about this with uh, John in, the, uh, in our private chat room, and um, uh, we believe these are estimates by independent uh, analysts. We don't recall Iran uh, having made statements about the diameter. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, Mike Elliman uh, believed the 680 millimeter estimates. Um, uh, so if it, was, <laughs> if, if it was reasonable for Mike, uh, we, we kept it in. Um, Emanuele. Uh, you wanted to pose another question. Do you want to do that? Uh, can you do that right now? Can we unmute uh, Emmanuel? I think he's. Yes, please. Uh, uh, sh very shortly, I hinted my previous question to grade zone operations. Uh, supposing that uh, the uh, supply of uh, systems to proxies like Houthis in Yemen, uh, Hamas in uh, Gaza, and Hezbollah in Lebanon or uh, militias in Iraq are part of a regional strategy, peripheral strategy and alliance the reverse against uh, enemies such as United States, Israel and Saudi Arabia. Are the, some systems like UAVs uh, or uh, missiles used to strike Israeli tankers uh, in, uh, in the Gulf uh, part uh, of gray, gray zone operations? a kind of grade zone warfare that uh, Iran uh, is actually 
practicing against uh, his enemies without uh, any attribution. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, uh, Fabian, I, I think this is probably yours again. Um, um, yeah, I would say definitely. So it's uh, very, very convenient for Iran to have proxies that have very sophisticated capabilities because we're seeing this, for example, recently with the upticks in the tax in Saudi Arabia, which a lot of analysts see as directly related to uh, the kind of pressure Iran wants to apply to the West through one of its allies. So I would say it's definitely part of the gray zone campaign. It can be part of a local conflict, like when the Houthi strike some military camp in Yemen, it's not really related to a direct Iranian interest, an indirect Iranian interest, yes, but it can also be part of gray zone campaign. The one thing I would like to add is just how incredibly dangerous this can be, because when you look at ballistic missiles, the Iranian ones are very accurate and they are very reliable, or at least to some degree. But, you know, especially ballistic missiles, drones are a different issue. The effects are very hard to calculate. So when you fire a missile against Riyadh, and these are not very accurate, but these are firing, the result could be absolutely nothing. Like, um, or they could be 20 killed Saudis, 20 killed foreign expatriate workers. It's just very, very unpredictable and very risky. And that's where I really see the danger of using ballistic missiles uh, in, who, in proxy gray zone operations. Okay, well, I, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. I, I apologize. There are several more people had questions, including uh, a good one by Ite Barlev at the end about why on earth would Iran be, you know, having underground um, missile uh, launch bases that are susceptible to preemption? Um, we didn't discuss that in our report. Maybe we can further that discussion offline with you, Ite. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks to everyone for joining this uh, with your very good questions. Thank you to my colleagues for uh, taking all the tough questions. Uh, and for um, their substantive contributions to what I think is one of the best reports uh, that I've been involved with at Double I Double S in my time. So um, thanks and goodbye.